Father God, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful morning you have given us, God. More than that, the gifts that you've bestowed upon us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God. Thank you, God, that you have given us access to you, living water, unending life through you, God. We pray this morning that you illuminate, that you reveal to us in your word, God, what happens in this place that we call heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy. Please continue to use us and reach those in our community. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we are in Revelation chapter 22, looking at verses 1 through 7. If you don't know where that is, go to the end of the book, and it's literally the last chapter. This is the last chapter of the entire Bible, the last uh, prophetic words that have been written is the book of Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. Um, since February, we've been actually teaching through the book of Revelation, and, and, and we've talked about this a lot. People think this is scary or weird or they've seen things in movies and get the wrong idea of what's going on revelation means apocalypse in greek which simply means the disclosure the appearing coming light and enlightening manifestation or what's being revealed meaning jesus christ god himself is disclosing and unveiling all the mysteries of the end of humanity a lot of people have asked over the years, what's my purpose? What's going on? What's coming next? It's all been written in God's word. It's laid out very clearly. Literally, all the mysteries of the end of humanity uh, is documented here in the book of Re Revelation. Um, we are in the best chapters, in my view, in heaven, talking about the characteristics of heaven. And John, the apostle John, actually receives this vision from an angel where he's taken up into heaven while he's in a Roman prison camp on the island of Patmos. Now, I've been there. You go there now, there's buildings, beautiful rocks and beaches. During that time, it was a Roman prison camp. It was a work, an enslavement camp where people went and they literally worked people to death. And this is where John is. Um, in these living quarters, in this cave, it's black carved out rock when you go in. He literally sees Jesus and He's taken up to heaven, and he's told to write messages to seven churches, specifically challenges, all the challenges that we would face today. He gets to see the tribulation, this seven-year period of 21 uh, individual uh, cups of wrath poured out on the world after the church gets taken out. Eventually, we see this final battle called Armageddon on earth when all evil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist and the devil are literally cast away, which ushers in this period called the millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign on earth where Jesus will live as God and will be his people. At the end of this period, the devil's going to be loose for a short time, which will bring and trigger what we call the white throne judgment, when all evil and sin will be judged, and those who have not chosen to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be separated from God, from all of eternity. That's the choice, that's the result of sin. And what happens next is John gets to see and get this place called the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, and the new earth. This is where we are, the final part. Evil's out of this world, and God reconstructs everything. And he sees this new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. In, the, in chapter 22, we're going to see the final inspection of heaven and a final message from Jesus. And last week, we saw these incredible details of heaven. People have always been like, I want to know what heaven's going to be like, what it looks like. Well, we figured out last week where that phrase, the pearly gates, come from. Each one of these 12 gates is a giant pearl. It makes sense now, right? But the shape of heaven's interesting. It's a giant cube. Its measurements, they measure exactly what it is, 1,500 miles each way, this place is giant. I think one person I, I listened to this week said it would be about two thirds of the the width and length of the of, of the United States and high, uh, plus the height. They said the walls were like brilliant diamonds. The streets were pure, clear gold. On the foundations are twelve uh, precious stones. And this place is going to be so amazing, so much more than we could possibly document. Now, 
the interesting thing is called the New Jerusalem, and here it is, it's not new to God. You know who it's new to? Can anybody guess? Us. To us. It's going to be new to us. This place called the New Jerusalem has always been and always will be because it's where God's throne is. And this morning we'll continue about heaven and we'll highlight these three themes as we get close to finishing out this book. And we're going to talk about the characteristics of heaven, the privileges that come along with heaven, and also the immediate response of believers. As John's tour of heaven continues, he saw it from an outward spot where the angel took him up to a high mountain so he could see over. Then they went in deep to see the detail that's happening in there. Picks up in verse 1, chapter 22, says this, And he, meaning the angel, showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. John's continuing his tour with guide up, that's guided by an angel. And in heaven he shows him this literal uh, river called the water of life. And like everything else in heaven, this is another representation of what it is. Perfect, pure, clear, no pollutants. It's not the Chester Water Authority, okay? <laughs> this is God's water authority. It's so clear that I'm sure it would reflect the glory of God, bring praise and worship unto him. This water flows, cascading down, it says in the text, from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Meaning God himself is the provider of, of this water and in a dazzling, sparkling, never-ending stream. It's what it's going to be like. And here's why. Because everlasting life can only come from God. But more than that, life, there is no life outside the independence of God. God is the one sustaining all life. There is no life operating outside of him. He upholds all things. On earth and also in heaven. So we might think that food, water, sun, the eagles is what gives us life, right? That's what we think gives us life here and now. But the truth is, it's the Lord. God is the one sustaining all things. He's the one that's giving you breath to wake up your eyes. He's the one that's given all things to the outside world. He's the one that brings rain and, and makes flowers grow and trees providing air. He's upholding all things. He didn't press the start button and go to sleep. He's been there designing and sustaining all things every single day. That's why it's a gift to us. There is no life, physically or spiritually, outside of God. There's nothing outside of Him. And we're supposed to live and know and understand that the point of this river is to have unending access to eternal life because God Himself is life. We're to live and know that Jesus, He said, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to him, uh, no one comes to the Father except through, th through him. Meaning he's the one that sustains us in all things. So, in fact, this living water that we will see in heaven in the book of Revelation is available here and now. It's available here and now. Jesus said, I am the living water. But one day, it will be cut off from the world and only accessible to God's children in heaven. And as the tour continues, we see this in verse 2. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. Now this phrase when it says in the middle of the street is best translated in the middle of the path, meaning the tree is in the middle of the water and the water is flowing around it, meaning it's on either side of the river, uh, this tree is being where it is. Um, so the tree of life has the same access to God. It's the same as the tree planted in the Garden of Eden. Got to remember, in Eden there were many different fruits, but there were two specific trees that God planted. One was the knowledge of good and evil. That's where Adam and Eve ate from, which, which made them like God. That was a lie. You can be like God, meaning... That's where each one of us gets this understanding of where we can divide what's right and what's wrong. This is why scripture says each one did what was right in their own eyes. It's the result of the fall that we would be like God. We would know good and evil and we could judge that for ourselves. It's not good. As a result of that, God cut access off because 
in the Garden of Eden was something called the Tree of Life. Where if, if man had access to the Tree of Life, they would live eternally, forever, like God. So God cuts them off in the Garden to have no access to the Tree of Life, and therefore no direct access to God. And here's why. God's intent is to dwell with his creation. He walked hand in hand with, garden, uh, with, with Adam in the garden. He wants to dwell with his people. And as they're cut off, they didn't have access to this tree of life anymore. God is our provider. He wants to provide for us. We don't necessarily need food or water to live in heaven. Um, but to know that we always have access to God because he's our provider and he desires for us to be with him. Now, having access to food and water is an expression of being blessed. And we were just sharing this with someone the other day, especially in our culture. To have access to food in the refrigerator and running clean water is an anomaly still in this world today. But these verses highlight something very cool. That in this gar- in, 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 in heaven there is a tree that produces fruit. How many kinds of fruit? Well, the scripture tells us. Twelve. And it also says monthly, meaning that there's going to be indefinite different varieties of flavors and foods for all of eternity. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Now, there's going to be no reason to measure time in heaven. So the idea is that this happens forever, that regularly God's going to provide something different, almost as if each one of us can have our own individual different experience continually forever it's going to be amazing god loves to be our provider those who have kids get to see this on friday i got a chance to take max out to this model toy train shop out in uh in marples anybody been to like a model train shop yeah you're broke aren't you so how do i know that because i'm broke right now um but you should have saw the look on max's face he's been wanting to build trains with us. Actually, Brian Madonna made me this board that I was using for trains months and months ago. We've been planning to set it up, an idea of something I would do just between me and my son, and, and Ava comes along too. So we got a chance to go, to go around. Well, she's three, so she doesn't really know what's going on yet. But I got a chance to take Max out to this store, and you got to imagine, I was blown away. You're talking thousands of trains, different sizes and tracks and little things to tinker with, and Max was just blown away. I could just see the awe and wonder in his face. He was totally, totally overwhelmed. And you know what? I love being a provider for my son. I love being able to bless him and give him things that are enjoyment. And I'll tell you why, because that's God's love for us. He loves to provide for you. He loves to give you the things that you need to grow and thrive and survive and things that you will enjoy. And that's what I picture these foods like, these fruits in heaven that each and every moment is going to be new and it's going to be a new reflection on how we worship and praise God. Yeah, we're going to eat in heaven. It's going to be awesome. But in heaven, we eat for enjoyment and for worship to praise unto God. Who here likes to eat? Like I'm the only one, okay? Okay. So in heaven, there's not going to be any Weight Watchers or the gym. We're all going to be in new bodies, and we can eat as much as we want because it's for enjoyment. We're not going to have to work out. We're going to be like Jesus in the way he came back to earth, right? He was able to go through walls and be places instantly. I don't know the exact details, but that's what our bodies will be, be like in the redeemed nature. We will be like him. We will enjoy food God creates, Because he wants to bless us. But we're also told this tree has something special, leaves. It says the leaves are for healing and and for the nations. Which is like, wait, we're in heaven. Like, do I need to be healed in heaven? So it's true, there is no illness, there is no injury, there's no sickness that would require healing in heaven. The word for healing in Greek means therapia. Has anybody heard that word before? Healing. Therapeutic. It's only used four times, and it doesn't always imply that there's some type of illness involved. It's only used four times, twice for healing, and the other twice is for household. Think about that. God provides therapy, household. How many people have been traveling or been out, and you're like, all I want to do is go home? 
I just, I just want to be at home. You know what's at your home? Your loved ones, the people that you're around. It's therapy to be around loved ones. And all of us knows what it's like to be in a broken family structure where it's untherapeutic to be at home. Not in this place called heaven. It's therapy. These leaves will provide um, something so interesting, health-giving, a therapeutic value to us that are there. In life, heaven will be fully energized, enriched, and exciting, and will also be for all the nations. And we shouldn't be surprised that in God's kingdom, there's many different people from different ages, different times, different backgrounds. I don't know what it's going to be like. Like, you know, all I know is it's going to be so cool. Be eating food, you know, talking with different people. You know, you're like, I'm from so-and-so in the 1500s, and I would walked with Jesus back in the day, and I was the one that, you know, uh, developed things along the way. It's going to be so interesting and so cool, and we'll be able to dine. And you know what we'll be? A household, a family, a place where everybody belongs, will be totally fulfilled in every way, not just in, um, in some type of pleasure, but it will just be total fulfillment. And through this, it, it, the scriptures unfold that, 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 that being in Christ gives us many privileges. Look at verse 3. Here's the biggest one. And there shall be no curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. That's us. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there is no light there. They need no lamp nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. He himself is light. He is our sustainer. It wraps up with this. And they shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. As John tours the new Jerusalem, he couldn't help but notice that life is completely different in heaven. The most dramatic change is this. There is no more curse. What curse is he talking about? The curse of sin. The result of man being separated from God is gone. But deeper than that, because we know that the, there was a curse to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. One was that the man would toil by the sweat of his brow, it said, day in and day out, working in the garden, this desire to work, and it's going to be painful all the rest of his days. Has anybody experienced that? Mm. Oh, two people have experienced work pain? Okay. <laughs> the curse for the woman was pain in childbirth. Thank you, Eve. And here's the other one, that, her, that she'll desire her husband, and her husband shall rule over her. Two parts of the curse. These things are gone for good, forever. There is no stain of sin. There is no separation from God. There's no fallout. All of those things are gone, wiped away, just like a tear being wiped from your face. The removal of the curse also means the end of sorrow, pain, and death, which brings up this amazing point that we'll be able to fully serve God, not out of a chore, not out of a mandate where I have to be at an event on a Saturday, but out of desire, out of love, out of, uh, out of passion. We'll want to be with God and serve Him completely, which brings up, what are we going to do? i got an answer for you. I don't know. I have no idea what we're going to do, but I know this, that God's, God will provide an infinite variety of tasks to do because God's mind is limitless. We are going to have all sorts of cool things to do that's going to keep us engaged and it's going to serve him. Who, know what, who knows what that is? Only God can conceive. But you know what the text also tells us? God will serve us. It's what Jesus said. Part of us serving God is God will also serve us. It's going to be perfect. And the cherry on top is this phrase. and We will see his face. We will see his face. Those in heaven become perfect, holy, and righteous, and you're able to see God's face. It's impossible for anybody in the hum that's a human to see God's face. You'd be wiped out for all of eternity. That's how holy and powerful he is. But in heaven, that will be completely gone. We'll be able to see him just like we're looking at each other. And I long for those things. We keep bringing up this idea of family and household. Don't you desire to see your loved ones or the people that you've missed? Wow, I just long to look at you again. 
I long to set my eyes on you. Paul writes these in the, in, in the epistles, uh, in, in his letters back to people. He longs to see them. He longs to see the Corinthians as jacked up as they were. He wanted to come and see them. Not only that, we belong to God, and he places his name on his forehead. Now, I know this. When you own something, you put your name on it. And I was going to have the perfect illustration this morning. The Woody toy, okay? Does anybody know Toy Story? On his, on his shoe. Underneath, you lift it up. What's he write on there? Andy. You want to know why? Because that toy belongs to Andy. That's what you do when something belongs to you. You mark it. You put your name on it, right? Uh, Back to the Future. Calvin Klein was on the underwear, right? I you know, thought it was the name. All right. That's how you whittle down to one person. So Now we know the ages of people that are here. But if anybody's seen Toy Story, the truth is you mark something that belongs to you. And just in case you missed it, John reminds us again in verse 5 that there's no light there. That they don't need a lamp or a sun, for the Lord God gives them light. For, for, for we shall reign with him forever and ever and ever. Meaning this capital city we call the New Jerusalem is a place of indescribable, unimaginable beauty. It's way more than we could ever possibly conceive. Because the center of it is the brilliant glory of God. That's what radiates out of all things. And, 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 and it's going to radiate off these precious stones and the gold. And it's going to illuminate things that we've never even could possibly imagine. And then verse 6, the angel says this to John. These words are faithful and true. That word faithful means trustworthy. They're trustworthy. You trust. Trustworthy, trustworthy. You can depend on them. You can depend on them. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things that much must take place shortly. This angel is revealing all the things that Jesus Christ has planned out from the beginning of time. He's showing all those things to us. We get a chance to see behind the curtain. There's nothing hidden from us anymore. God's word is what we can depend on. If God says it, I guarantee it's truth, it's a fact, it's going to come true. One jot of God's word is more powerful than anything else in this world. Everything he wrote will come true. It's not a movie, this isn't a joke, it's not a game. This is what's real. It's not a dream in any way. All these events will come to pass. That's why he's telling us this. And then in verse 7 we see a change. We see something that will take us through the rest of the book, and Donnie will close us out next week. It says this, And behold, Jesus speaking, Behold, pay attention, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds or keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. There's a blessing that comes out. This change of speakers is Jesus himself speaking to John. Behold means to stop and pay attention. And it says he's coming quickly. And I'm, you're like, I don't think you understand what quickly means, God. Because to me, quickly means immediately, here and now. And in the Greek, quickly means shortly, without delay, soon, by surprise, suddenly. That's the idea behind this. Quick, without surprise, suddenly. Could happen at any moment. It's meant to keep people on their toes and to occupy. It's not our business to know when the masters come. Our business is to do the will of the master. It's not to find out or decide when he's coming or not coming. It's to do and to serve him 24 hours to be ready and to be prepared because at any moment, it could be tonight. We hope after the Eagles win the Super Bowl this year. Could be tonight. Could be tomorrow. But we're supposed to be expectant and ready at any moment. Remember, surprise, suddenly, because we are called to do the will of the Father. And he shares the six of seven Beatitudes. There's one more to come. A few weeks ago, I printed out and I sh shared the seven Beatitudes. Beatitudes are blessings uh, that Jesus gives to us throughout the book of Revelation. Beatitude means blessing. It says, blessed who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Who here desires to be blessed? And there's some, is there some people that don't? Maybe that was a bad question. Blessed is he who key, heeds, 
keeps the words of the prophecy. We're being charged to heed. That's where the blessing comes from. The blessing equals those that heed. Well, what does that mean? It means to keep, to hold fast, to guard, to protect. This morning as I was studying, I got hit with something. You know what you heed and you protect? The things that are valuable to you. What's valuable to you? Is it your gold or your silver or your money or your secret text or the things you look at on social media? The private things you do between... Is that what's valuable to you? Is it power? Is it dominance? Is it love? Is it something else? What, what do you value above all things? And it gives us an insight of what's valuable in the kingdom of God. Humans are valuable in the kingdom of God. What's more valuable than that? God's word. Because it provides the truth for humans to be reconciled unto Christ. And he knows that we walk in a world that's messed up, that things are going to chip away at what we believe, and, and, and we're, we're prone to wander, we're prone to fall into deep and dark, difficult things. We all understand that. And he's saying, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, in times of feasting, in times of fasting, in times of, of great joy or in times of trouble, you want to hold on to something, you hold on to the blessings in this book. Keep it. Protect it. Hold on to it. Memorize it. Live by it. Make your decisions by it. God's word is the most valuable, the most important uh, thing we could ever possibly have. It has an extreme value. What do you value? Disciples are called and commanded to guard and to protect this book of Revelation. We believe God's word is infallible. It's perfect in every way, shape, or form. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness. The word says, for, and for those that are uh, thoroughly equipped for all good works. That's what God's word is for. We believe God's word is a fact and it's the only definitive truth. It's the only way I can know what's a truth or a lie is to know God's word because when a fake pops up, you instantly know it. You know it's a fake because you know the truth so well. All of scripture is to be guarded, also defended as well. Not that we need to be the defenders to the world. We need to be the defenders to our heart and to our brother and our sister, and those that are in Christ, our congregation, the people that we're serving. That's where this needs to be defended. There's a little boy that comes around to our homework club that we, I've been broken because we start to see him hanging out with the drug dealers a few blocks up. Does anybody know what happens, right? Yeah. They sit on the stoop, oh, yeah. and they have a little conversation, 12 years old. What happens when he's 13 and 14? Because that's cool, right? Next thing you know, they're selling drugs. Next thing you know, they're, 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 all their wisdom comes from that? No, 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 no. We have to protect those things. We have to defend it. God's word is life. God's word gives us the knowledge of good and evil. This is what Paul says to Silas in 1 Timothy. He says, guard what's been entrusted to you as a minister, the gospel of Jesus Christ and those that are his disciples. Guard what's been entrusted to you. It's your responsibility to guard what God has given you, his word. It says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard what's trusted to you. Retain those things, the sound word, those life-giving things. You hold them into you because that's what's in Christ Jesus. That's what love is. That's what produces faith. It says, guard through the Holy Spirit which dwells in us the treasures which that have been entrusted to you. You think treasures are cars and houses and sexual experiences and, 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 and parties and all sorts? No. This is what treasure is. This will never be able to be chipped away by the world. No rust can get into it. Nothing can fade away. If you want real treasure, we don't look at the outward or what's in a bank account or what people... Uh, uh, accumulate those things are good but it's not treasure this is treasure wisdom god's truth this is what will get us through life those who live as if jesus could come at any moment will live in obedience to the scriptures because we love god's word god doesn't command believers to read revelation merely to satisfy some type of curiosity about the future 
He doesn't do it so we make arguments and charts and graphs. Has anybody been in one of those weird arguments? Is that just a pastor thing? It's like weird discussions about theology. No, no, that's not the point of this. God inspires this book for a purpose, to reveal the glory of his son and to call believers to live godly and obedient, assuming he's going to return at any moment. That's what God has given us. And he's given us a roadmap how to depend on him, how to do that. Again, the purpose of Revelation is to not provide entertainment, but to, remo- to promote living godly in Christ. Yesterday, a group of us went out to Kensington. And if people don't know, Kensington is one of the epicenters, not only for the United States, but, but for the world as well. A group of us traveled to a ministry called the rock to meet and to serve the rock in that area and to go out on the streets and meet with people on the streets. It's literally ground zero for the drug market. It's ground zero for homelessness, drug addiction, crime. You can just imagine all sorts of illicit and illegal activities that are happening up there. We didn't go up there to see a spectacle or a show. We went up to be used by God to help minister to people. The second thing is to help reveal the realities of desperation that's still in this world. Ground zero. The first camp we came by, I was talking with uh, Craig, one of the pastors up there, and there was a girl sitting maybe in her 40s or 50s on the ground, had this needle with a mirror trying to figure out how to shoot it in her neck. And in her neck, there was an open wound with blood coming out as she's trying to inject these drugs into herself, sitting on the street, homeless for four years. This is the way she lived her life. She lived on the streets, separated from her family, separated from loved ones in this broken mess. And I'm broken that anybody would settle for this type of lifestyle in our world. We have to understand that there's brokenness and sin in this world. There will always be brokenness and sin in this world, not just in Kensington, but in the hearts of humans, all over the place. It's not just the outward. It's always going to be the inward first. God is the one that judges the hearts. We have to understand there's brokenness out there. But you want to know what's true? Do you know what's in heaven? Right here and right now, a river of life. There is life for everyone that is perishing. For the person on the street, the person in million dollar homes that don't know Jesus. In heaven, there's a living water of life. Jesus said, the one who feeds on me will live because of me. As humans, we're prone to seek things of this world that bring temporary treasure, but everlasting life is only going to come from God. Again, There is no independent life outside of God. But here's the cool thing. That river of life is accessible now. It's not accessible at some point in the future. It's accessible now, today, through Jesus Christ. He provides that. That life change can happen instantaneously for all of eternity based off the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the point of this river, that we would have unending access to God himself for all of eternity. I wanted to close with this. In John chapter 4, we see something very interesting. You don't have to turn there if you want to. We're going to look at a few verses. But Jesus leaves Judea and he departs for Galilee. And um, Jesus sends his disciples away to get food, and he sits by Jacob's well. The text says the sixth hour. It's midday. He's by himself. He sends, excuse me, he sends his disciples away to get food, and he's by himself. And as he was waiting, in the middle of a day, a woman comes by by herself. No friends, no family. Might as well be homeless, living on the streets. She's not. But she's an outcast needing to get her water to drink, to cook with. That's what you do to get your water. You travel to a well. 
And it's interesting because, first of all, men, especially Jews, didn't have open conversations with women. They just didn't do that. But second of all, the fact that she's coming during the midday by herself, meaning she had no group to travel with, which means other people thought she was bad news. Best way to say, don't hang around with this woman. Usually Jews will go around Samaria to get to Galilee, but not Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus has different plans, and he shows up there, and he meets with this woman. The first thing he does is says, get me a drink. We pick up in John chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. And Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to her, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is really deep. Where do, you, where do you plan on getting this living water? Where do you get that living water? She asked him another question. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yeah, he is. Who gave us this well and drank from it, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become like a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. A woman came for human water because she's humiliated in her lifestyle and she's coming to get the substance that keeps her and her people alive every single day. This is her life, what she does all day, every day. Jesus says to her that she had the living water that you would never thirst again. Go to this well every day or get this well where you would never thirst again. Hmm, let me have a choice here. Uh, this water that I have to drink all day every day or water that satisfies you forever for eternity. Today, Jesus offers that same living water for us, and we can share that back with so many other people. See, the water really represents our works, our sinful desires, the things that we've decided that satisfies us all day, every day. When Jesus is saying, access to me is total, totally satisfying. It's what's going to set you free. If you believe and confess that I'm your Lord and Savior, you will have access to eternal life greater than what we see and hear and know here and now. Amen? Amen? That's what this life is. The question I wrote on this is, what does your life flow from? What does my life flow from? Are we seeking access to this eternal life, Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Savior? Is that what we're drawing our life from? Jesus said, the one who feeds on me or lives because of me? Or is our trust still in, I'm a good person, or I've done nice things, or God's going to create great on a curve? And if we do have access to this eternal life, is my mission and passion to serve him and his kingdom and to help reach other people back in our community? This book, this disclosing as we wrap it up over these next few weeks is, Jesus revealing what's happening at the end times. And if you believe, that's us already. There is no harm that can come to us here and now that can separate us from the love of God and being with him for all of eternity. So what do I care if people talk about me? What do I care if I'm being called into a zoning hearing? What do I care if I lose everything yet have access to him? If we can just share with one more person and see another soul saved, it's all worth it. Amen? Amen? This word is being disclosed. Keep that blessing for you today. If we don't remember what it is, in verse 7, he wraps it up and says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Guard them. Keep them safe. Remember that's what's valuable. If you want to dump out all your treasures, you can bring them here. We'll take care of them. It's kind of like a joke. But in all seriousness, we have to decide what's really valuable, and that's God's word for our lives. It's the only thing that will be able to change anything in the present for a future glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, 
God, thank you that you've given us a gift so much greater than what we believe as treasures in this world. And that's you, access to you. And God, I know that we're hurting and we're broken and people come here or will watch from many different backgrounds and times and things that are happening. God, you are enough. You are enough. One day we will all pass from this world, Lord. And we desire to be with you for all of eternity. Thank you that you've blessed us with living water, with the prophecies in this book. God, we pray that that's useful to our soul here and today. It helps the next person and ultimately worships and praises you. Can't wait to see your face, Lord. Thank you that you write your name on our forehead. We belong to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.